Good morning and welcome to worship. There is so much planned for you today that I just can't wait to tell you about it. Today we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. This is where we celebrate Jesus dying for all of our sins. So get your grape juice and your crackers ready. But not only are we celebrating the Lord's Supper, we have some awesome preaching and some amazing singing just for you. And so my friends, you're in for a treat. It's a special day and welcome to worship. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. I'm Bill Gabbard, and I serve the congregation here at Second Ponce as Minister of Music. We're happy that you're joining us this morning. We're happy that you're joining us in prayer, in song, and in listening to God's word faithfully read and faithfully preached. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it together. Join me as we sing together, Come Thou Almighty King. As we continue today in worship, may we pray together. Gracious God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus dying for all of our sins. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, may we reflect on that sacrifice. May we honor that sacrifice. And may we reflect not only today, but often about that sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for your church. We thank you, Lord, for the resources of your church. And we pray that we may be found faithful and great stewards of the resources that you so freely give. Thank you for your grace. And again, thank you for your sacrifice in Jesus. It's in Christ's name that we do pray, amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to be with you again. I wish you were here with me in person, but you know, if you move just a little closer to the screen during the children's sermon, it might feel more like we're together in person. So I want to invite you to move just a little closer for the children's sermon. You know, we are entering an important season in our church life called stewardship. And that's the season when we talk about giving and the importance of giving to God. And this reminded me of a beautiful story, something that Jesus saw with his own eyes. You see, there was a woman who was a widow. That meant that her husband had died, and she was all alone. She wasn't very wealthy. In fact, she was poor. She didn't have all the things that she needed. But one day as Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he watched as people were bringing their offerings to God. You see, giving an offering is an act of worship. Many people were bringing lots and lots of things because they had a lot of money and were wealthy. But this widow who only had very little, came and she brought two copper coins. Back in Bible times, these coins were called mites, and they were not worth very much at all. It was all she had. You see, this woman came and put her two coins, the mites, into the box for the offering because she wanted to bring her best gift. It was really her only gift that she had to bring to God 
to worship Him, to praise Him, to thank Him. I'm inspired by this woman, and Jesus was too. For she gave what she had and brought her best gift to worship God. You know, boys and girls, we can bring our best gifts to worship too. We can bring some of the money we have and share it by giving an offering. You can ask your moms and dads how you can do that now, even when we aren't able to gather in person. You can also bring other gifts to worship. If you love to sing, lift your voice as an offering to God. If you love to dance, you can dance and offer that to God. If you love to do artwork, you can make something amazing and offer that to God. If you love to encourage and serve others, you can offer that to God. When we give an offering, we are worshiping God and praising Him. So this week and every week, I want to encourage you to bring your best gift to worship God like this widow did. Let's pray and ask God to help us with that. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the story of this faithful widow who brought her very best gift to worship you. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to bring beautiful gifts to you, our best gifts that we have. Help us to worship you not only on Sundays, but every day of the week. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is David Anderson, and I'm a member of the Stewardship Committee. As this is the first Sunday in October, and October traditionally has been set aside as our Stewardship Emphasis Month, I'm here to kick off the campaign. The theme for the campaign this year is One God, One Mind, One Voice, and One Second. And it comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's no secret that the coronavirus has had a major impact on our ability to be able to worship and study and and Bible study. But we've, uh, through the unity of God, we've come up with some pretty creative ways to continue that Bible study and worship. We have live streaming of the services on Sunday, which are also shown on our website. Uh, Through uh, Zoom meetings, we're doing Sunday school classes, uh, committee meetings, and even choir. And then, of course, Doc's Wednesday night uh, Bible study. So we're finding ways to still get together and still worship. This year's stewardship campaign and your commitment to it is going to be more important than it's ever been before. Uh, Soon, in the mail, or you may have already received in the mail, uh, an envelope that's got the brochure and the pledge card. Take a few minutes and read through the information. You'll have three ways in which you can return your pledge card. You can send it by mail. uh, You can drop it off at the lockbox outside the North Bridge. Or you can do it online if it's easier for you to do it that way. But whichever way you do it, we ask that you spend time and uh, prayerfully consider your response. And then uh, when you do respond, respond timely. Thank you and stay safe.
Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Gracious God, you call us to fullness of life. Deliver us from unbelief and banish our anxieties with the liberating love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Pour your love into our hearts and draw us to yourself, and so bring us at last to your heavenly city, where we shall see you face to face through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today we hear together the words of Romans. I'm reading from chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to hear that scripture reading several times in the next few weeks. Those two verses from Romans will be the text for each of the sermons during this stewardship emphasis. Hopefully, by the end of four times together, we'll have memorized this text. But we have made it to October, which means the stewardship season is upon us. And part of the reason for using just these two verses for the whole month is that they are just so chock full of preaching about stewardship. I, it reminded me of the old uh, Prell commercial where they say you just put a little bit, little dab, and then all of a sudden there are just suds everywhere. Well, well these two verses have, have stewardship themes just waiting to foam up all over the place. And so for the rest of October, we're going to give ourselves to these themes. The, the four themes that are emerging from these two verses also reflect Second Ponce's core values, worship, discipleship, mission, community. One God is one week's focus. That's today's theme. That's worship, our, our combined commitment to the one true and living God. Next week, one mind, discipleship, shaping our minds to follow the teachings and claims of the gospel. Then one voice, our unified mission to help the human hurt that's all around. And then we'll conclude with what we're calling one second, our, our commitment to each other, the, the important commitment we share to the community that's here at Second Ponce. So this month we're going to focus on our stewardship, our giving, our serving, our praying, our blessing, and it comes together around these four shared values. But today our focus is on worship, the central act of the believing community. I have, I have a clear first memory of being in a Sunday worship service. I, I, I remember it so clearly, my earliest memory of being in worship. And sadly, my earliest memory had nothing to do with preaching. Instead, it was a clear memory of sitting next to my dad in the pew and taking in his level of engagement and seriousness. A guy up front in a wide tie would stand up and pull a hymnal and do this, and my dad would stand and start looking for the number, and he was ready to sing. The preacher would say, let us pray. My dad would stop and get still as the base of an oak tree. He'd close his eyes, focused on prayer. Well, obviously, I didn't have my eyes closed during that because I wouldn't have known that his eyes were closed. You see that I was not quite as focused at that time as he was. 
But my earliest takeaway from worship isn't the music, the preaching, the praying, but this enduring impression that it was something to be taken seriously. My dad and I could cut up at the restaurant, in the stands at the ball game, but this hour had his full attention. And I learned that there was something at stake. Usually now when we talk about worship litany, we're, we're talking about the order of service, the worship bulletin. But in my childhood, there, there was an unwritten worship liturgy that started before 11 o'clock on Sunday. On Saturday night, we would get out our church clothes. My dad would shine his shoes. He would shine mine if necessary. My mom would supervise uh, my two sisters getting their clothes ready for Sunday to make sure they didn't pair their cowboy boots with their crinoline dresses and so forth. But, but we were getting ready for Sunday. There was a sense of anticipation. And this, this pre-church litany included getting our Bible ready and our Sunday school quarterly, which frankly I usually skimmed in the car on the way to church. But before getting in the car, we got out our offering envelope. And in those days, there were little boxes on it that you had to check. We had to check the little boxes on our offering envelope. Bible brought, check, yes. Bible read daily, better not check. That would be kind of like lying in church. But you check off the little things, then put the offering in the envelope, lick the flap, and you were ready for Sunday. My offering was usually in those days about a dollar. But something was going into that envelope because we were not going to church without a pressed shirt and shine shoes and an offering. As I, as I said, I learned that there was something at stake on Sunday. But frankly, as a young child, I didn't get it. So, Sunday was about strange practices and strange words. Holy Ghost washed in the blood. It was all strange to me. But I knew it mattered at some profound level and that Sunday demanded our best, our most keen attention. <laughs> all right, let's be honest. You and I both know I wasn't sitting in the pew like uh, Beaver Cleaver sitting next to June on Sunday listening to every word of the preacher. I was probably kicking one of my sisters with those nicely shined shoes. But very early on, I had impressed on me that worship was of such vital importance that any flirtations for Sunday's time had no chance we were going to be in church. And that when the organ started, there was something going on in that hour that was unlike any other, and it was no time to play. It was time to focus. Well, then I came to understand. I was sitting in one of those services, 12 years old, not paying attention at first, I'm sure. I was probably trying to do the Braves line up in my head, you know, Daryl Evans at first, Mike Lum at second, and so forth. Or I was probably thinking about my classmate Hope Fisk. But somewhere in there, something extraordinary happened. With all the limits of a 12-year-old mind and vocabulary, I had an experience of God's love God in Christ found me, the veil was torn, the glowing presence of the divine broke through the rafters of that simple church building and called my name. I was enveloped in some kind of mystery I couldn't grasp, caught up in a tingling wonder I have never known, in the grips of a love that went clear to my toes. 
I had encountered the God that my parents and my Sunday school teachers had been talking about. And all of a sudden, this worship stuff started to make sense to me. These adults are so focused and hopeful and ready and open because they've encountered God in this place too. And they know it can happen again. It, it, it can't be manufactured. God doesn't reveal on schedule or demand. But we can still construct a service to glorify God. We can still come and open our sails to the holy call of God in our lives. And sometimes, sometimes, in the context of shared worship, God opens the curtain and winks. In the context of gathered worship, we have experienced the nearness of God's grace again and worshiped. We know it can happen again, but more than that, we're gathered to offer our gratitude that it happened once. That the Almighty God of creation called our name even once, which is enough to merit our worship over and over and over again. We have been saved by the love of God in Christ. We gather to offer up our adoration and our gratitude together. There's no, nothing more central to our life together than putting all else aside to glorify the God who granted us this life abundant. But as central as it is to the Christian life, I find worship kind of squirrely to try to define. <laughs> Made me think about uh, St. Augustine saying, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain to him who asks, I know not. Some things we know, we, we just don't know how to put language to it. I, I think I know what worship is. I have worshiped. But if you ask me to define it, explain it, I guess that's why I tell childhood stories. I'm not a very accomplished theologian. But, but here is my favorite definition written by someone else. It, it, this is a definition by William Temple, who was Archbishop of Canterbury in the 1940s. For worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by His holiness, the nourishment of mind with His truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose, and all of this gathered up in adoration. My parents did not hand me an offering envelope on Sunday morning because the church needed my dollar. They didn't weigh out whether the church was ahead or behind budget. I knew nothing of, of payroll and upkeep and Sunday school literature and the like. What I knew was that it was my act of worship, part of what it meant to be present Part of what it meant to be in, to be surrendered, adoring, worshiping. As an act of my surrender and my worship, I would not walk into the holy place without my offering. My, my parents were putting in 10% of their combined incomes, but teaching me that my giving was part of my worship of God too. Second Pont still mails out those little rectangle offering envelopes, though ours don't have the little boxes to check. 
And, and the, the act of putting it in the plate is an act of worship just as sure as taking the bread and the cup are acts of worship. But even in the pandemic, even before the pandemic, I became one of the ones in the church who started to give online, electronically. I would encourage you, if you have not already, take a look at the website. It is so simple to set up and do. It is pandemic proof. It's vacation proof. Every month, my gift to the church is drafted. It is the first draft of the month, symbolically. It is the first thing taken out of my checking account. But for those of you who give online, when we're back together, I want to encourage you to take one of these cards from the pew back. We, we made these in recognition that a lot of people do give online, and our giving is an act of worship. So this is an opportunity to put into the plate something that says, I give electronically, so that we can all participate in that act of giving placing something in the plate as a part of our shared worship. Former Mercer University President Kirby Godsey uh, used to say when he was fundraising for the university, he'd say, I don't want you to give until it hurts. If it hurts, you haven't given enough. I want you to give until it feels good. If it hurts, you still haven't given enough. I'm not asking you to give because we won't be able to buy Play-Doh or goldfish for the children's ministry. I'm saying that if you're not pledging, giving, supporting your church, then you have not fully given yourself away to the worship of God that is so central to our shared life together. As I said before, worship is not a spectator sport. We're in. And our gift is a part of what it means to be in. Hear the Archbishop again. Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by His holiness. The nourishment of mind with His truth. The purifying of imagination by His beauty. The opening of the heart to His love. The surrender of will to His purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration. Our worship, our, our submission, our quickening, our nourishment, purifying, opening, surrender, adoration... And we come every Sunday with an offering envelope in hand because it is our act of gratitude. It is our worship to do so. This table that's been set in front of me is a symbol, a symbol of so much of God's goodness and Christ's love. And in these elements, we, we do see so much of what the Archbishop outlined for us. There's holiness and nourishment and beauty and love and purpose. And our response is adoration. For our sakes, Jesus gave his life away that we might inherit life abundant and eternal. And if we let our imaginations go to the depth of this sacrifice, to, to really understand the surrender that this table represents, there'd be no way to respond with anything but gratitude and adoration. In other words, if this table ever got hold of us, we would never think of walking into this place without our envelope. How can we, how can we come to this table of sacrifice not willing to offer our own sacrifice as well? And the night before Jesus sacrificed for us, he was in an upper room with the disciples. And 
they were preparing for the Passover meal, but Jesus surprised them. He took a loaf, blessed it, broke it, and he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in like manner, he took the cup saying, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you join me in proclaiming the Lord's death and sacrifice? This is the bread of life. This is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Oh God, we stare at the elements of this table, aware of your brokenness and your presence. in adoration of the gift of life eternal. And might you make in us contributors to your great project to reclaim this world through the love that this table represents. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. When the apostles finished their supper with our Lord, they sang a hymn, Let's Sing Together. Let's sing, He Hideth My Soul. It strikes me when we come to the table together, when we're spread apart in our homes and other places, that we are united with all of the Christian community throughout all of time, that our partaking of the meal together and apart connects us with Christians all over the globe who are sharing that meal with us today, and the Christians throughout history who have shared that meal. There's so many good things going on here around the church. We're inching closer and closer to being back in this room together for shared worship. But right now we're celebrating that we're in phase two of our regathering plan, which means that groups of 25 of you can sign up for one of three designated spaces in the church that are already socially distanced and with masks you can gather for your Sunday school class, your uh, prayer group. Several groups have already taken advantage of this. If you have not already, it's time we saw each other. So call the church office and get your group signed up for one of those three spaces. I also wanted to let you know that the ministry of this church is not just electronic. We are making a difference beyond the airwaves. I got a letter this week from the two chaplains at the Shepherd Center 
It was a handwritten note thanking us for the 250th check they had cashed that came from Second Ponce to support their chaplain ministry. And they said that it makes all the more difference in this time of COVID and all the challenges of the pandemic. There's so many good things you all are contributing to that we need to celebrate. And so I just wanted to celebrate some of it even though we're not together right now. And now go in adoration of the one who has come to save and has taught us to serve. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Josh, and I thank you so much for watching all together today. Worship will be awesome. But yet again, I stand here sad, angry, and full of many emotions. As I've had to watch, just like many of you, more injustice in our world. I've seen all the debates on social media. I've watched people tear each other apart verbally and physically, and I stand here right now saying, I'm not here to debate with you. Because it's a very simple fact. Breonna Taylor was someone's friend, someone's daughter, but more than anything, she was God's child. You can't debate that, can you? None of us can debate that. And what my prayer is right now is that our world would begin to see each person as God's creation. Genesis 1 and 27 should never be omitted from the Christian Bible as it tells us that we are all made in the image of God. Nobody should have to scream this. Nobody should have to fight about this. This, this is God who said in his word, we are all image bearers. My prayer right now is that we would respect each other, that we would love each other, that the injustices would cease because we all matter to God. And so, yes, I know worship's gonna be awesome, but I believe that racial reconciliation is more than a dream, but it's the gospel. And if we are gonna be faithful believers, Jesus followers, right? Then we must do what Jesus would do, and that is to honor the image of God in everybody else. All together was started for this very reason, that all people will come together and worship, no matter your political differences, your ethnic differences, your belief differences, we come together to worship the risen Savior, Jesus. I pray that's why you're tuning in. And I pray right now, that all of you would take the word that is preached, the songs that are sung and everything and apply it to our world, that our world would be a better place. You watching are God's child and the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. It should be easy and it is for me. I pray it will be for you. So friends, my prayer is let's do life together. Let's stop tearing each other apart because we are all children of God. Thanks for watching. Let's worship. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered. Mended and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free, I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that says. Blood.
take our failures, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your
to the sky and say, you're beautiful. Oh,
today is an amazing day because we get to talk about risk management. You know, I'm standing in a breezeway and stairs are behind me because every time that you take a risk, you actually step out hoping that there is a step to comfort your foot. You never know what could happen. It could be great or it could be horrible. And so we take risk in so many forms of our life. And it's been said that if there is no risk, there is no reward. I even love the way that President Jimmy Carter once said to go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. Today, my friends, we're going to talk about risking control because I don't know about you, but Lord knows I love control. You see, to risk it means to attempt something without having all the details as to how or if that will work out. We take risk in marriage, in business ventures, in transferring schools, and even in walking out of the door each morning. Risk are all a part of life, but hey, don't get me wrong, I know risk are scary. The reasons that risks are scary is because the product of taking a risk could be awesome or it could be horrible. This is why so many people like to say, uh, maybe, maybe not, maybe, uh, okay, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you see, the biggest risk that I've taken in my life, believe it or not, is getting married to Lauren. <sighs> I wanted to know, would she love the good parts of Josh along with the weird parts of Josh? You know, those weird parts of Josh where Josh likes to get up at 2 a.m. and watch ESPN and holler at the TV while she's trying to go to sleep. I wanted to know, would she run the marathon of life with me that is sometimes filled with hills of hope, but also filled with rough terrain that can be terrible. However, the risk that I've taken has proven to be beneficial for us both, thank God. But friends, if we are ever going to gain a deeper relationship with God or make the world a better place, we have to learn how to take responsible risk. So let's discuss this month, risk management, and all of that and what it entails. You see, today we will be consulted by a man by the name of Peter. Peter, at this time had heard reports of many false teachers in Asia Minor, which is today Turkey. Paul had two reasons for writing this short letter in the Bible. It's really only three chapters. You really need to check it out. The two reasons he wrote this letter were that Peter wanted to discourage people from listening to false teachers. Peter also wanted to encourage people to keep the faith as they were being led by the Roman emperor of this day by the name of Nero. Nero, he was an evil man. He was so evil that he killed his mother, he killed his second wife, and he even burnt up half of Rome just so he could rebuild it and the people would hopefully praise him. He was crazy, y'all. <laughs> the people of this time, they were led by immoral leaders and Peter is reminding them that although you may be fearful, Although you may feel like you have no control at all, I want you to risk your fear and control to deepen your relationship with God. And so we catch Peter in the first chapter of his letter, right here in verses 5 through 8. And Peter encourages these believers saying, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. From these verses, we understand this big, I mean gigantic truth, and Peter is telling ancient believers as well as us to follow the strategy that leads to the Savior. Peter gives us building blocks in this text. It's the building blocks of a strategy that leads directly to Jesus. In case you're wondering what in the world is a strategy, Josh, I'm so glad you asked, even virtually. A strategy is an intentional plan of action. 
Sport teams have strategies. The armed forces, no matter what branch, has strategies. Businesses have strategies. Amazon even has a strategy. Chick-fil-A has strategies. H&M has a strategy. But guess what? God also has a very intentional strategy, which if followed leads not only through this life, but it gets us to eternity with God. See, Peter right here, he speaks to everyone here saying, I know that times are tragic, but follow the strategy. Fatigue may be settling in, I understand it, but follow the strategy. Peter, in written form, reminds these believers as well as us, guess what? I know you're enduring some hardships at the moment. They were enduring some psychotic, childlike type of leadership from this Roman emperor, Nero, and he was telling them basically, don't stoop to his level, but rise to God's level. He says, I want you to literally follow the strategy and exhibit goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Peter offers seven characteristics which make up this strategy in an effort to communicate to ancient and current believers that you cannot always control what happens to you, but you can control how you will respond. You see, these ancient believers in this context of this time, they were surrounded by false teachers who were spreading this idea that there was no need for self-control. You can throw that right off the window. The reason that there was no need for self-control because they taught that it just did not matter what type of actions you committed. You were just to live your life. It's similar to us saying YOLO that you only live once so you could you should just live as recklessly as you want to live. And so back in this time, however, this type of teaching calls people to do just that, live recklessly. But friends, don't worry, we are, guess what, the same way. You see, there's a remnant of false teaching even now in our society where many people say, well, Jesus died for my sins so I can just live any way that I want to right? No. God understands, yes, that we will make mistakes and that we are not perfect, but God desires that we grow, that we mature, and that we allow God to transform us from the inside out. Growth, maturity, and transformation are all a part of the strategy that leads directly to the Savior. But if by chance you don't understand this, you say, okay, those were Peter words. They have nothing to do with me. Allow me to submit and suggest to you a coupling of sorts. Use Paul's words to Titus in Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Paul tells Titus, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. God wants us to do what is good. God wants us to be loving. God wants us to care. God wants us to live according to what he has set forth in his word. Follow the strategy. It leads directly to the Savior. I'm going to admit something to you. I may ruffle some feathers, so get ready. I am not a fan of the Denver Nuggets basketball team. I cannot I just cannot stand them sometimes. But one thing that I cannot knock is the buy-in from all the players to the team strategy. This young, scrappy, they, this young, scrappy team never gives up. They believe they can score on any team in the league, and they believe that they can do it quite quickly. I've watched this team come back from double-digit deficits. I've watched them come back from 3-1 deficits to win a game. Why? Because they have a strategy. Never give up, trust each other, score quickly, and play some defense. See, when teams get a lead on the Denver Nuggets or they take their foot off the gas, the Denver Nuggets never deviate from the strategy. They keep this strategy going, and it has proven to be quite beneficial. Well, friends, I want to I let you know something. 
Even though I dislike this basketball team, they teach us a lesson that no matter how our situation changes in life, we must never depart from God's strategy. When life is a mess, we should strive for goodness. When life is confusing, we should continue to learn more about God. When life becomes crazy, we should still exhibit self-control. When life becomes frustrating, we must learn to take a dose of perseverance. When obstacles are presented, we must exhibit godliness. When people are challenging or disrespectful, we must give them mutual affection and love, not hate. You see, Peter and the Denver Nuggets of our day teach us the strategy exists for a reason. And as we follow the strategy by God of exhibiting goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love, that strategy helps us live a good life, helps the world become better, but ultimately leads to eternity with Jesus. I know we do not control everything that may happen to us, but we can control partially some things, such as our response to stressful situations, our prayer life, our actions, our speech. We control those things. And what we are partially in control of must, must point others to God as well as ourselves. So I want you to ask yourselves these questions. Reflect on them. Chew on them for a moment. Are you responding to situations the way God desires? Are you living the way that God wants you to live? Are you being faithful to what God has given you or are you constantly just asking God for more? These areas can be controlled by us, but if we do not follow the strategy, how can we ever expect more from Jesus? Peter writes to us and our friends from the ancient past, and he tells us, hey, you need to relinquish all of your need for control and just embrace the strategy that leads to the Savior. So, friends, if we're going to do some risk management, we got to let this whole need for total control go. You don't have to be a control like addicted person. Let it go. But embrace the strategy that comes from God. But secondly, I want you to literally surrender everything to God. Nothing should be off limits. See, currently, in case you say, man, I cannot surrender everything to God. It's just some things I just have to be in control of. Guess what? I want you to know some of us may feel that way. But guess what? We are currently in surrendering 101 class. Mm -hmm. The whole world is. We are having no choice but to trust that one day the pandemic will cease and we will be able to walk around outside amongst people not wearing masks, right? We are trusting that one day soon we will be able to hug each other again, go to church and sit right next to somebody who may not be our blood family member again, actually go into a place and not have to say, okay, hold on, let me make sure I'm six feet away from this person. But guess what? We have no clue as to when one day or someday will happen again. But guess what? All we can do is surrender, trust God, and hope that God will literally work on our behalf. You see, this action of surrendering means that we put our hands up. We say, God, I have done everything that I can do. I can't do any more. It's all on you. That's what surrendering looks like. And I know the action of surrendering is so scary because it's saying, I don't have control over this, but God, I know you do, and I'm trusting you. The action of surrendering is so uncertain. The action of surrendering, yes, is a huge risk, but I was once told this great truth is that when everything is uncertain, everything that's important becomes clear. See, in our uncertainty, we notice that we do not have all the answers. It becomes clear that we don't have the full capacity to actually fix our lives. It reveals the weakness that many of us attempt to hide, and more than anything, it shows our need for God. Uncertainty, it serves as the light that reveals the mess that we are 
and our need for God. So to help us today, I want us to go to yet another passage of scripture that talks about the life of Judah and, Ju and Israel. You see, these people were just like us. They had a hard time surrendering to God, but they had an even more challenging time of prioritizing God. It was an up and down roller coaster of faith. And if you think I made this up, when you get some time, go read First and Second Chronicles in the Bible and you'll see all of what I'm talking about. But yet today, I want us to look specifically at a portion of First Chronicles. You see, at this time, believers, they were challenged just about by everything else. And yet the Lord tells them, guess what? Your relationship will be noticed by how you live. God reminds Judah and Israel, as well as us today, that we should risk our need for control to ultimately make God the centerpiece of our lives. Listen to a portion of David as he is praying a prayer of surrender in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. David prays, praise be to God, Lord, the God of our father Israel. From everlasting to everlasting, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Do you hear the total surrender in that prayer? David says, God, you are above everything else. That shows honor. David says, wealth and honor comes from you. You control everything. That's truth and surrender and perspective in action. You see, David has the right perspective and he shows us why we, in fact, should risk control and surrender everything to God. He shows us that we should do this. Why? Because God is in charge of everything. And most times we spend our entire lives stressed out and jacked up on caffeine trying to be a God that, look, we don't even have the capacity to be. We are always trying to do so much. Got to go here. Got to be there. Got to be this to that person. Got to learn this about that thing. But guess what? We just need to learn how to say, I can't control everything, but I serve a God who can. I was told this this week and it stepped all on my toes and I said, ow. So when I read it, you just say ow virtually. And it was this quote, no matter how much we attempt to control everything, it is impossible for us to control everything. I'll say it once more. No matter how much we attempt to control everything, it is impossible for us to control everything. From David's words and his great prayer of surrender in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 13, we get these application truths from the text. We have no control as to when we will die. We have no control as to when tragedy or triumph will happen in our lives. We have no control as to how long our overly blessed seasons will last. We have no control as to when our overly blessed seasons will end. We have no control as to how many moments we will have with our loved ones. We have no control as to if we will run into traffic on our way to work or not. We have no control as to if someone preoccupied behind the wheel will swerve into our lane or not. But guess what? God does. God has eyes on us every moment of every day. God knows the amount of hairs or not on our head and the issues of our hearts. God is in charge of our lives. And if we stop stressing and start surrendering, we will notice how free how exciting and how vibrant life can actually be. If we're not able to risk control for God, how then can we ever expect the reward that comes from God? As we ponder on risking control to make God the centerpiece of our lives, 
I invite you to think with me about a story I heard about a little girl and her mother the other day. You see, this little girl treated her mother badly because she was ashamed of her. The reason she was ashamed of her mother was because her mother had a huge scar that went across her face. The little girl would never invite her mother any place. And one day, the mother asked the question to the daughter. She said, why is it that you never invite me to school? Why don't you ever invite your friends over to the house? And this daughter had the courage and boldness to actually say, it's because I'm ashamed of you, mother. Her mother said, why? She said, it's because of that nasty scar that's across your face. I couldn't bear to introduce you to my friends as all they would do was stare at your ugly scar. This mother felt very down, but she asked her daughter to sit down for a moment. And she started telling her daughter that one day she went outside of the house to get some water. But as she looked back at the house, she noticed that the house was on fire. And so she risked her life to go back in. And as this daughter was a baby at this time, she ran to her daughter's crib and noticed that the fire was engulfing the crib. She risked her life by sticking her hands down in the crib, raising her daughter to life. And when she raised her daughter to life, she proceeded to run as fast as she could to the exit. As she was running to the exit, a beam that keeps the house up began to fall. And as it began to fall, she gently threw her daughter to safety in the front yard. But the beam fell on the mother's face. And it seethed through the skin of this mother's face. And it was for about two to three minutes that the beam stood there until she was able to remove it and walk to safety. But she says this to the daughter. She says, the reason I have this scar on my face is because I risked my life to save your life. Friends, I want you to know that this mother is not the only one who has a scar that's pivotal and important and deals with us. Jesus has quite a few scars as well. Jesus has scars on his hands. He has scars on his sides. He has scars on his forehead. He even has scars on his feet. Why? Because he died for sinners like you and I. Jesus risked his life by giving up the seat right next to his father to come to earth and deal with sinners like like you and I. Jesus gave up being on the in crowd. He gave and risked being like. He risked even being rich. Why? So we could become children of God. Friends, I want to know by now, after hearing all of this, will you risk your need for total control to follow the strategy that leads to the Savior? It begins with love and its book ended with love. Will you risk your need for control and surrender everything to God? Because God rules all, is in all, and is above all. The, I'm talking not about your friend down the street, but I'm talking about the God who knows the end when we only know the beginning. The God who provides the purpose when we don't even know the next step. The God who sees all, knows all, and it's in all, that's a God worth risking control for. And so friends, today we talked about risking control. And I want you to know, our church is about to do some risk management as we're going to risk our control to ultimately make God the centerpiece of our life. How? We are going to do a do good challenge. It's going to happen on October 10th. And it's from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. No, you don't have to stay the whole time. What's going to happen is there's going to be an app and you're going to be able to pick certain things to do good for someone else. So it could be writing an encouraging letter, sending a text message, picking up trash off the ground, and you get points for this thing. When you get points for it, you can win some prizes, but what it does is it risks our control of something to actually give hope, comfort, and goodness out to the world. If by chance you want to participate with the Second Punch team, I want you to email altogether at spdl.org and let's talk about this do good challenge. 
Anybody can do this. You don't have to stay 12 hours. You can stay 10 minutes, one minute, or 30 minutes. You can do a million challenges or you can do two challenges. But I want you to risk a certain bit of time out of your day to sow goodness into the world. If by chance you don't know Christ and you are interested in, in learning, what does this whole Jesus follower thing mean? What does it mean to say that someone has received salvation? Email us. We would love to speak with you about that. Friends, also, if by chance you want to sow into this ministry, feel free to go to spdl.org. The giving option is there, and the drop-down menu for All Together is simply all you have to do is click on it and give as your heart leads. Friends, I want you to know as we conclude our time today that we all serve a great God that we should risk our need for total control and be faithful to what God entrusts us with. Our together takeaway is that total control is an illusion. Partial control is a gift and test from God that shows what we value. I want you to live risky in a positive way. Partial control, be faithful. Relinquish your need for total control and allow God to work in your life. Have a great week.